Okay, hi there. Welcome to the fifth in our series of six lessons, special lessons designed for Year 11 students who are thinking of transitioning to A-level economics in the autumn. What we thought we'd do, we'd take six aspects of the coronavirus pandemic and the economic crisis that surrounds it and think about how it links to some important economic ideas. We've explored micro and macro, uh, the impact of the Im impact of the crisis on different industries and businesses, uh, the ways in which government and Bank of England are trying to prevent a depression. And in the fourth lesson, we took a look at behavioural economics and drew, uh, just drew a few ideas from behavioural psychology. Now, we have two lessons left, and I thought it'd be important to think about inequality, the gap between income and wealth, and whether the pandemic is likely to, or perhaps is already, widening the income wealth gap. So this is a series of videos and we'll take you through some concepts as we go through. First of all, let's look at the difference between income and wealth. What do we mean by income? Well, income is essentially uh, a flow, hopefully a regular flow of money coming into the household per week, per month, from wages and salaries, from your job. Uh, you might also be able to earn some interest from your savings, perhaps occasionally some dividends if you own shares, and uh, conceivably some rental income if you own property. Now, for the bulk of people, payday each month is a crucial day. It's the biggest single source of their income, the wage or the salary that you get from your job. People do have savings from which they can derive and, and earn interest. People have shares, uh, which occasionally businesses will pay out dividends to their shareholders. And some people, well, several million people in the UK, own property and that can generate a flow of rental income. Add those together you get household income. Well what's the difference between income and wealth? Well wealth is basically defined as the value of a stock of assets. Assets that you own such as property, shares, pension funds and perhaps long-term savings. For most people the biggest single source of their wealth is if they own a property. Uh, so we call that uh, the equity in a property or the household wealth tied up in bricks and mortar. But also people, people can accumulate wealth by building up long-term savings, either in the form of a bank account, many of you will have those, or perhaps people starting to put some money into a pension fund or some other form of long-term savings. That's a way of building up wealth. And also people might own assets which have a market value, perhaps some antiques or some fine wines or a family heirloom, which in theory uh, could be marketable as a price. We could include that in marketable wealth. Now, the income that comes into a household uh, flows in and the gross income is the amount of money that people earn before any deductions, before direct taxes are taken off and other deductions. Disposable income is a really key concept for economists. We often hear people talk about their disposable income, and that is your gross income after taxes, after direct taxes, such as income tax, have been taken off, and also adjusting for perhaps some welfare benefits that might come into the household. For example, income support if you're out of work. So disposable income is income available to you to choose to spend or save, uh, after tax and benefits. This is quite interesting if you look at the distribution of the incomes of individuals in thousands. On the x-axis is household disposable income. The word equivalised just means they adjust for the fact that households are of different sizes. There are single people households or families with, uh, with many children. What can you see here? Take a look at the, at the, uh, at the chart here. You can see that there is a skew a lot of people operating just below, well, half operating below the median, uh, but there's a long tail of people on high incomes. Uh, a limitation of using the mean, of course, is that it can be influenced unduly by just a few people with an extremely high income, and therefore doesn't represent necessarily the, the standard of living of the typical person. Indeed, reading off the chart for 2019, mean disposable income 35,900, Median, the middle point in the range, 29,600. So there's quite a big difference of over £6,000 in the mean. And that is because the mean is lifted by those very high income earners at the top. 
what are the lowest paid jobs in the UK. Let's do a little thought experiment here. If you can press the pause button and uh, write down two examples uh, of what you think are examples of low paid jobs. And let's see if they make it into the list that I'm going to show you of the top 10 occupations with the lowest full-time weekly earnings. So you've got a full-time job and the money you take home at the end of the week is the lowest uh, of the 10 lowest occupations in the labour market. So press the pause button, write down what you think are two examples of low-paid jobs and see if your two choices uh, fit into the, into the 10. Well, here's the data. These are the lowest paid jobs, lowest paid occupations in the UK as of April 2019 in pounds per week. Florists earn the least, just over £300 a week for a full-time job. And look at that, people working as launderers, dry cleaners, shelf fillers in supermarkets, checkout operators in supermarkets, waitresses, hairdressers, bar staff, etc., kitchen and catering assistants. Those are the jobs in the UK which offer the lowest median full-time gross weekly pay in pounds. What are the highest paid jobs? Again, press the pause button, have a think about uh, two examples of jobs that you think would make it into the top 10 for the highest full-time weekly earnings. So press the pause button, have a think, jot it down, and let's see if you get the right answer. Well, here are the highest paid, again, highest paid occupations in the UK as of April 2019, pounds per week. Uh, senior police officers are in there, tram and train drivers, London underground drivers can often earn a lot of money. GPs are in there, legal professional, lawyers, sales directors, aircraft pilots, flight engineers and chief executives and senior officials come top by some distance, of course. Now, keep in mind, this is the median full time gross weekly pay. Of course, if you understand the median and the mean, there'll be a lot of people earning a lot more, a lot more uh, than the median figures. But it does help to explain, and I think, and identify the gap between high and low income. Now, one of the issues to do with the pandemic uh, and the pressure that has been on uh, the economy and the NHS in particular is that many of our key workers, essential workers in many ways, are actually low paid. Uh, this is uh, data from Checker Salary. And it shows that if you're a retail assistant or a care worker, a refuse collector for the local collector for the local council or childcare worker, your average gross annual earnings are less than £20,000 a year, well below uh, the median earnings of just, just under 25000 a year. Your paramedics, registered nurses, even they are earning only just a little bit above the median salary. And of course, this is one of the key issues, is it not? That many of our key workers, essential to the battle against coronavirus, are amongst the lowest paid in the economy. Just very quickly, what's the difference between earnings and pay? Well, uh, your earnings include your basic pay, my monthly salary, for example, from my job, and I might be eligible for some overtime pay, maybe working at weekends or in the evenings, perhaps a bonus at the end of the year, and occasionally other payouts if the employer chooses to pay them. So earnings can be supplemented through bonuses and overtime. Now, one of the big issues is the huge gap between the earnings of leading executives in the UK and the average worker in the UK. Keep this in mind, uh, there's a lot of data on this chart, but by around tea time on the 6th of January most years, the average FTSE 100 CEO, the average CEO of a FTSE 100 company, will have already earned the complete annual pay of the average full-time worker in the UK. Indeed, uh, this data shows that after just 33 hours of work, uh, the CEO has, has earned the annual pay, the yearly pay uh, of, uh, of the average worker. The median earnings of a FTSE 100 CEO, three and a half million in 2018, compared to just under 30,000 for the typical worker. So there's a huge gap, is there not, between the earnings of the average worker or the median worker in this sense, and the CEOs. Uh, and in America, that gap is even bigger, uh, as we will see later. So this first video has just brought you into uh, the loop in terms of what we think about income and wealth. In the next video, we'll look at inequality.